everyone. Thank you for joining me this afternoon, the last hour of this, not afternoon, morning. I knew I would say that. I'm Barbara and I will be talking to you about large language models. Just a few words about who I am. I've been in the industry for last almost 20 years. I know, I look incredibly young. I started as a software engineer and uh, moved to the, to the field of data science and became an ML engineer. I've been uh, in several big companies. Actually, um, what was said, I've, I've worked in many companies, big, small, medium-sized, big corporations. I'm ex-Google, ex-Twitter, ex-Microsoft, currently working at Docker. Um, you can find me actually anywhere. If you Google my name, I'm the only person in the whole world, or at least on the internet, who is named like this. So wherever you find me, like LinkedIn, my website, that's me. That's almost for sure me. Today, today's agenda will be talking about large language models, starting with introduce, introducing them. Then I will show you how to build your own. I actually am going to use Andre Karpathy code because he's an excellent teacher and he built a very nice small model uh, that you could basically copy and, uh, and run and see how large language models are being built if you want to do that. We'll go a little bit beyond GPT because everyone is talking about GPT, but there are other models out there. And at the end, I would like to show you how you can customize your model for the task, for the use case of systems that are generating text based on knowledge. It will become more clear once we, sorry, once we get there. Let's start with the introduction then. Everyone has heard about GPT, right? Everyone, yeah, everyone. That's why you're here, right? Because they, they made headlines. Like this is like another, another moment in time when science is making headlines, right? Is AI going to take our jobs, take our lives, conquer the world? Well, they are claiming they, they can. When you talk to uh, AIs, when you talk to large language models, when you talk to chat GPT or GPT-3 or 4, or whichever number it's going to be now it's 4, um, they seem to be able to do many things. They still don't make my coffee, but they, they claim they would, right? So when we think of what can, what can we do with large language models, it starts simple. It starts with stuff like summarization. This is when they are taking our jobs. Those poor people who are writing summary of books at the end of them, now you can just feed it to chat GPT. You don't have to hire those. They would just do it quite well, actually. Task like sentiment analysis, but not just sentiment, but maybe classifying if the content is appropriate, for, for example, for kids. This is what large language models can do. Named entity recognition, finding out the information in text. What was the date of that specific event? What was the name of this general during that uh, war or spe specific battle? And then there is the word of possibilities. People are using large language models to generate text, to generate emails, write, write, write emails for them, memos, uh, memos, taglines, uh, books, new episodes of Simpsons, new books of Games of Thrones, right? This is what we hear. But also generating stuff like, can you explain to me like to a six year old, right? So this is also the, the fact of gener uh, generating text. And the thing that almost everyone has used once you had an access to chat GPT, answering questions. Instead of Googling, we're now asking chat GPT. Well, actually, large language models are generating text. And how we use that text is uh, the value that we get from it. So first of all, when we, uh, laser is not working, but first of all, when we have a prompt, um, for example, when we think of generating, we prompt our model with the first part of the sentence, and this model is generating the next one. 
when we ask the question is generating the answer. When we put a paragraph or the whole book into the prompt, it generates summary of it. So this is like high level black box, what large language models are doing. And how do we generate that prompt? We cannot actually start building a model or even using a model without talking about how this prompt should look like. So those are two examples that I found on the internet that are actually used. One is OpenAI and another one is uh, from Simon Warden, I think that was his name. Um, you can see that most of the times words are translated to tokens, but it's not always like this. For example, don't is translated into two tokens, indivisible into three. I don't quite understand how it's done, but you can feel some words can be uh, basically split into several tokens. It's not always one-to-one, -one. but to grasp what it is, is basically a word is a token. It could also be a character, character could be a token. So you have to prompt your model with not words, but actually numbers. The way how ChatGPT is doing it, when you're asking a question or, or writing something, is actually taking your prompt and generates those tokens and then feed it to the proper model that is behind it. So let's build one. As I said, I used a code from Andre Karpathy. Uh, he's very good. I put the links here for you to try it on. There is a lecture that he gives for the full uh, code, but there is also a code lab, a call up, uh, code that you could basically run yourself. There is also a GitHub repository that he has. So he created something that is called Nano uh, GPT and will be generating text like Shakespeare. The tokens in this case are characters and given the prompt, like starting it, it will be generating text, then taking this generated text, generating even more of this. So basically that's how, how these things work. He started with very simple model. This model is not great for text generation. And it basically is creating embeddings. Those are the tokens. Gets, gets them through the softmax and then tries to um, predict the next character. So then the next character that has like the highest probability to, to be after the previous one. And this one really didn't work well. So the, after the 100, genera 100 steps, 100 iterations, it's as dumb as it was without training. So when we think why we need a specific model for text, because we do, the first attempts were recurrent neural networks. There were either like vanilla recurrent neural networks that were taking your first word, predicting something, taking that prediction, taking another word, bringing it together and try to predict another one. And it was like mashing together all the tokens that go inside of that model and trying to generate something or trying to classify something. And they had several, uh, yeah, limitations. For example, there are models who are called long, uh, long short LSTM, long short memory, uh, time, long short time memory. And actually, it was very short time memory. It did not remember stuff in longer sentences. It did not remember stuff at the beginning of of the paragraph. So this, um, yeah, feeding it with a lot of text basically wasn't very good. Uh, because every word is being processed sequentially, there, is, there was no optimization in terms of uh, parallelization. And also, it, because it squashed those tokens together, there was not much information about the uh, distance. So, transformers, the new way. Transformers have several innovations that were introduced. Uh, basically with GPT. You could see that we have like two blocks here and here. This part is called encoder. This part is called decoder. This is encoding and this is decoding. And at the end, we have text generation. This part is not new. The parts that are new 
are what's inside of those blocks and that the fact that they are stuck together. So we have first thing, we have something that is called positional encoding. That's that is new. And I will talk about this in a moment. Second, we have add and norm in several places on both sides. And we have something that is called attention. And that attention was the thing that revolutionized transformers. We'll be talking today during this code only about the second part, because what we are actually are doing is prompting, taking the output and generating text. But for the purpose of this simple, simple model, simple code, that's enough. So let's start with attention. That was the thing that revolutionized everything. That was the thing that transformers basically are doing miracles, according to some people. The problem with LSTMs or recurrent neural networks was that we, uh, we did not know a lot of information about the words that were third in the se sequence uh, and what is their connection to something that happened before. And with that simple sentence, the cat scratched the sofa because it was very bored. What is this it connected to? What this it is, right? This is a very short sentence. LSTMs probably would manage this, but if you think of a wider sentence or the whole paragraph, that's not such a convenient thing. So attention is the mechanism when we say, given the word it, pay attention to those other words and how much attention. So here I just made it um, like darker. The cat is the, are the two words that it should pay attention the most. And um, very, and the sofa are also the words that it should pay attention because they are connected to what this cat was doing or how it was doing. And it may not have like straightforward uh, meaning to a human being, but the thing was this word knows now to pay attention, hence attention to the other words and how it can then uh, conclude things and do things based on that knowledge. So how is it done? It's done by matrix multiplication as neural networks are. We have three new matrices and one is the matrix for query, another for keys and another for value. They are multiplied by the input and create the vectors, query, keys and values. As you can see, query is something that we want to pass saying, this is what we are looking for. This is what we have, and this is what we want to communicate to you. They're all created from the input, but not necessarily holding the same information. And then what happens? Even more matrix multiplications. So we, we take query and key, multiply them, scaling. Sometimes there is masking, doing softmax, and then the result of this, again, we're multiplying will with the value. So that's the part of the transformer oh, that we have here. When you look at the code of Andrew, this is actually done very simply. We have three matrices and then we uh, multiply them. He used the masking, there is a softmax, and then we again multiply it with the value. So the math is really simple. The idea works miracles, as we see with ChatGPT. Another thing that is different with transformers, that's positional encoding. Uh, so basically the idea is we have uh, our input. Here is just a simple one. We understand attention. And we say we, we mask it with a vector that shows which position the specific word is in. So there are, again, different algorithms that can create that positional encoding. And what we do is basically we add it. So let's bring it all together. <laughs> it didn't, those things should be lower. <laughs> so it just didn't format well with this. Um, so what we do is we have embeddings, 
normal embeddings, and then we have positional embeddings. This also should be lower. And for the positional encoding, we just take them both and add. And this is going as an input to our neural network. Uh, if you look here, this is also uh, how we could do add and norm, nothing special. We just create two layer norms, which are the part of any framework of neural networks, and add it to the uh, add it to the vector that we are we're normalizing with. And it also does miracles because it creates a re residual residual connection and uh, really helps with backwards propagation. So this was the thing that was really known for a long time as a technique, but together with attention with positional encoding in transformers when having those blocks that are stacked, this really, really help and, uh, and speeds up the process of training the model. Those are the results. You can think of like Shakespeare generation as a, uh, a simple task, but if you if you look closer, if we're thinking of tokens being characters, it actually had to learn several things. First, it had to learn that there are words, that there are spaces, that there are sentences finishing with the with the dot, right? Uh, then it had to learn English. It didn't very well, but it's just few iterations. It has to learn English. It has to recognize based on Shakespeare that those words are in English and, and create them. Uh, it, it didn't just copy, as you can see, some words are made up. Uh, then it had to learn that it's, this is a play, that there is a capital uh, character name in capitals, that then there is a colon, uh, and, and then there, is, there are sentences. And the last thing, it has to learn how Shakespeare works. I'm not sure if it did. It's not my native language, never read Shakespeare in original, actually, apart from this task. But uh, the simple task, let's write like Shakespeare, so let's write Shakespeare's play, actually has a lot of tasks for this simple model to learn. If we go beyond GPT, there are plenty of other models. And this is just a screenshot from Hugging Face, uh, which is a very hot company at the moment when we talk about AI, because it has a hub of models people are uploading. Uh, some of them are closed, some of them are open sourced, so it really differs from model to model. This was taken at the beginning of July. I'm pretty sure if you go now, this probably will be Llama 2, which just was uh, published two days ago. But just to give you a uh, this is one of the hubs when you can have a look that there are other things than just chat GPT or GPT in general. Or there are some uh, models that are dedicated to the specific task. They may be smaller, but work well for the specific thing that we want. And we don't have to pay OpenAI for using it, right? Let's talk about Llama. I didn't plan it. I didn't know they would be publishing new versions. So I'll just tell you a little bit about this specific model, because uh, it was very interesting that Meta uh, uh, published. So first of all, it has several sizes from 7 billion, at, uh, 7 billion parameters to 65 billion. And what they wanted to do, that was their goal, was we actually want um, want this model to be very quick when inferring. So we may allow this model to learn, to be trained for a long time, but we want to optimize for, for when we ask the questions, right? From when we use the model. Because when you have a very big model, it may take time to actually calculate all those things. It has to go through those 65 billion parameters. Uh, so they did some kind of, uh, some few of the optimizations. So, for example, they uh, used causal multi-head attention. So they were not storing attention weights. Um, they did um, overlap computation of activations instead of using, um, no, th that was something different. They did overlap computation of activations, and this allowed the communication between GPU. 
and they also didn't use some of the stuff when they were uh, computing activation from the framework. I think they were using PyTorch. They built their own to be optimized. And this model actually overtook plenty of models, including GPT-3, in many tasks. So if you look for Llama, the new one or the old one, the paper is very approachable and it shows the results from different angles. Like it's not always how amazed we are as human beings when talking to the model. It's sometimes, is it safe? Is it hallucinating? Is it, um, can it be put in a task of mathematical inference, et cetera, et cetera. It's not always about <laughs> something like writing a new chapter of the book or the new TV series. So when we think about building our own models or using the models that we have, some of the chat, not chat GPT, the GPT models are usable. You can just get them, download them, and, and use them. They're not open source, but you can, you're free to use them uh, if they're not hosted. So if you want to play, if you want to uh, play with the existing models or build something that is more uh, complex than what we just seen about Shakespeare generation, there are platforms, plenty of them. Very popular Mosaic ML, they're not paying me, I swear. It's just very popular. Wherever I go, people are using it to build their model. It, it allows um, for a very easy use of infrastructure, which is always a pain for people who are focusing on ML and they need some proper engineering platform. There will be a talk today about platform engineering. So you will, you will hear probably about how difficult it could be and how important it is. So customizing model. I've mentioned you can just download the models either from Hugging Face or from OpenAI or from wherever when they allow you to get that model. Uh, and you can customize it. And why would you do that? There are several ways. So basically, again, like the high level, you have some pre-trained model, you customize it, and then it does something else or something more or something specific that you want. There is a typo there. Open source models may not mimic, it should be GPT, not GCP. Uh, so they may not be as, as good uh, in specific tasks. We are used to GPT to be just this holistic, thing that does everything. You ask a question, you ask it to write Shakespeare, you, uh, they, write, uh, uh, they write an email, they explain things like two, six years old. Those things may not be covered with every model. So open source model may have some limitations. So you may want to customize it, but they are free, for example, and that's what you may want to do. Uh, you may have unique needs, specific tasks not covered right, by that model. My favorite example is uh, talking like a six-year-old, right? This, this may not be covered by every model. Um, you may have some data that you want this model to work on that you cannot just upload there. You have to do it within your secure environment, within your secure setting. You may want this to use specific domain language. And I'm not talking about different languages, like human languages, although it could also be the case, like the models may be just in English and really rubbish with other languages. I'm talking about, for example, the legal uh, language, right? You may not want this to be colloquial, you want this to speak like a lawyer. You may want this to know specific domain knowledge. And you may say, actually, you know, chat GPT, it was, yeah, it was trained on like legal stuff, like books. It has knowledge, probably from my domain, only till 2021, right? If there is a new knowledge, new things, it won't know that. And also what sometimes we don't realize because they're very good at mimicking, we, they, they cannot go into websites and read it. They cannot upload it. They cannot go into data, database. And, uh, and get stuff from you. They cannot crawl the website. So you may need to customize your model to give that information to that model or to train it to the specific task. 
And there are a few ways, the three more popular ways are, uh, I will tell you in a second, but let's talk about the specific use case. And I would like to, you to think of the specific use case when we think about how we can customize stuff. You have your specific knowledge that was not covered by, uh, the, by the training data for your model, whether it's your open source or chat GPT, and you want to ask questions about this. So for example, you can ask a question uh, about Docker. How do I install Docker 4.21? ChatGPT wouldn't know about this because it was last month, right? For example, there is one technique that is called few shot learning. So basically you get some knowledge, some text, put it in a prompt and say like, these are some pieces of information. You put it in a prompt. Based on this, answer the following questions or answer this question, and then you ask again. And then model will be like, okay, this is the answer to your question based on what you put in the prompt. The problem with few shot learning is, um, first of all, prompt limitation. Now for chat GPT is quite wide, but still, if you want to upload your whole knowledge base, that, that probably won't fit. And if you want to ask again a question about the specific topics, uh, you have to ask again and upload it again to the prompt because it won't store this new knowledge. It's just during the inferring, it knows, but it's not storing, it's lost. The second thing that is much more complicated, it's so-called fine tuning of the model. And it is very complicated and there are uh, platforms there that are helping you with. Uh, so first of all, you need to build prompts. You need to feed this, these prompts to the model. You have to retrain this model so it actually stores the new information, but it's quite complicated. Building the prompts and building this new training. There is a very good uh, usage for this, for fine tuning, if you want to learn, teach your model to learn a new task, like talking like a six years old, or, uh, for example, if you think of not language, but vision, uh, if you have a model that is recognizing things, but you have we had this at Google, specific customer wanted to recognize specific hinges. I'm pretty sure it wasn't covered by any model that was vision. We fine tuned this model, feeding it with the types of hinges, and it was fine tuned and, uh, and worked very well with those hinges. For the language, uh, the technique is very often connected with reinforcement learning and having a human in the loop. So again, not easy, but there are platforms that are helping you. If you go back to the slide, I was showing different platforms. There was one of them that was helping you with, with doing it. Again, it's a service you have to pay. So what I would like to tell you is a third technique for this specific use case, as I said, you have a knowledge base and you want to ask specific questions, but few shots is not good enough because it has these limitations. So somebody can ask, how do I install Docker 4.21? And it goes into our system of information retrieval, AKA search, right? It gets to this knowledge base. It gets the specific, uh, parts of the content that are relevant to your question, gets the best candidates, so it ranks it. It's much more complicated than I'm showing here, but basically the search is taking the best candidates. Then you take those best, best candidates and you build the prompt like we did with a few shots. So given this information, answer those following questions. And then it actually is querying the model with that prompt and giving the answer to the user. To just go a little bit deeper with this, one very popular technique is to take the query and vectorize it. So this could be done actually by a service of OpenAI. There is an, an endpoint that will just return you a vectorized query if you ask it for. And then what it does, it just takes this query and looks for the similar ones that you already have in your database. How do you have them? Another thing that you have to build is take your content and 
make it a vector content. So you have vectorized content, but you also store the row values. And very popular technique of how you build the similarity or how you check the similarity is Cossian similarity. But there are other ways. There is something that is called uh, approximate neural neighbors that is uh, also that was also released by I think that time it was Facebook, not Meta. So it's called uh, Face F A I S S, and it just takes the best candidates and returns but this time raw content. It just uses those vectors to see the similarities between query and between the content. Very popular, not the only one, not the only way, but uh, plenty of companies are doing it this way. I, I've mentioned a few of the large language models challenges. This is my almost last slide, uh, but just to point out to you, models cannot read documents, cannot crawl, websites. They cannot query the database. You have to have an agent that does it. You may use AI in some ways with this agent, but to actually do a specific thing, you have to write a piece of software that does it. However, if you ask ChatGPT of some made up non-existing sites, but they have like a um, name that is suggesting the content, it will pretend it read it. And it will <laughs> just actually say, oh, this content is about this, this, and that. Make a big summary of something that doesn't exist because it just took it from the title. Um, sometimes it admits, I'm just an AI and I cannot read, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, new knowledge is not stored, period. Unless you fine tune, unless you like, train and train on the new knowledge, it won't be stored. To ask the same question, similar question, question on the same domain, you have to feed it in a prompt with the knowledge or the knowledge needs to be there when training. And the models can hallucinate. That's, that's the example I was showing, I was telling you. It just pretends it read the website or like it just concludes something that may completely be untrue and not supported by any data that it had during training or in a prompt. And it's very confident. So it's very hard to, um, yeah, to actually overcome this. One technique, not 100%, but one technique is based on, this con based, based on this information, answer this question. If you don't know it based on this, say, I don't know. And sometimes it listens to you. Uh, and there's something that is also prompt injection. So you can imagine, especially with stuff with agents, if you have an agent that is writing an email for you, I don't know, summary of something, uh, sending every Friday, summary of the week for your team. It may be interrupted, like SQL injections. Somebody can just interrupt into that query. So it's not really a um, well-known issue yet. And there are not many techniques to, to actually um, not allow it to do, but uh, yeah, this is, a cool, uh, this is a cool thing to, uh, not cool thing. This is a thing that you have to think of because if you don't think of it, you will build an unsafe system. So just to summarize, I made a quick introduction to what large language models are. I've shown you how Andrew Carpati was building a model of a very simple thing with literally there is like 50 lines of code, maybe, maybe 30. There was not much code there. And I've shown you how you could customize the model with my favorite information retrieval uh, for, using the, for the use case of using the knowledge base. And that's it. <laughs> I don't have much time we have left for the questions, but I'm open. In, in terms of these large language models, um... Python developers don't rate chat G GPT as highly as NLTK. I mean, NLTK is, is, is rated far more highly than I'm, I'm just wondering why chat, G chat GPT has just basically taken over the planet and some of the more highly rated language models are just, I, I, I'm just curious actually. I wonder if you've got <laughs> it, any it's answer. more like my opinion than a fact because I, I think it's just, Attention is on it because it's mimicking human thinking very well. 
if you think of an LTK or the other, uh, like LAMA or other um, models, if you compare them strictly by metrics, uh, like how well it does with mathematical uh, causation, right? Or, or, and stuff like this, there are several of them ways, then chat GPT or GPT in general is not, not going that great, right? However, it's mimicking so well that we just got involved in it. That's my opinion. And that's, uh, and now people are focused on it and working on it. So it's, it is becoming better. Like with the hype, it actually has this effect that is making the product better, even if it wasn't from the start. But that's, again, my opinion. Uh, uh, my second question was, um, you mentioned that um, these things can't crawl websites. Uh, you know, I, 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 I think you're referring to web scraping. Am I, am, am I right uh, when you say they can't? So you have to get the content and actually put it in a prompt, right? Uh, yeah, okay. So, so Unless this was a prompt from the website and during the training, it knew, it knew that this was the website, right? So that, that, that case. But if there was a content somewhere that wasn't during the training, they cannot just go and read it. You cannot just say, you know, Chuck GPT or whatever model, read that website. It's, I mean, it's effectively a, a different yeah. language. So I just wondered whether there were, there were plans to somehow integrate it with things where, well, requests and beautiful, beautiful soup and requests are the two things you would need to to scroll a website. That, that are there is, plans to integrate yeah, it with... Yeah, that, um, that is a very good question. And I think there are, but I'm not responsible for, uh, <laughs> you know, creating or upgrading Chat GPT. But... I think I read about this, like there is some effort uh, to integrate it, to make it like available as a service through ChatGPT, but I cannot be 100% sure. 